Hey. So today we're going to talk about Conway's Law. And my view on Conway's Law is we have fought the law many times and the law has always won. And Conway's Law says that software and the systems that you built in the software development industry end up looking like the organizational structure they were designed in or they were designed for. That they end up partitioned and organized in a way that matches the organization that built it. So if you have an organization, if you're trying to build something that is counter to your organization and structure, you are on a ro hard road. And this actually applies to non-software systems. I'm going to show you two examples. This is broadly applicable. The thing you build is mod that you end up doing ends up looking a lot like the organizational structure. So I'm going to pick here uh, cars. So why is Tesla is a small company with a small organizational structure. And in their case, they have decided that they wanted a single cooling system for their car. And so they have this thing called the super puddle. And it's one pump that handles everything. The Chevy Bolt is actually built by a traditional organization where different divisions or different groups are responsible for the different subsystems. So one team's in charge of the battery pack, one's in charge of the cabin, one's in charge of the electronics. And so what that means is they ended up with three cooling systems, right? Their cooling system structure matched their part structure. You can also see this in federal agencies, right? Uh, somebody from another country asked why we have so many police departments and it's like the way we're organized, right? So there are actually 65 federal agencies that have police that are authorized to carry weapons and make arrests. New York City alone has 16 different law enforcement agencies. Why? Because each organization in New York City gets its own police department. So software ends up looking just like that. Do I have this working? No, I don't. So we're going to try a different key. There we go. And that was the wrong key. And we go back to here. So I'm going to pick this small one here. So classic Agile kind of knows this explicitly. If you can take small, highly focused teams, they can get a lot done. And as you scale up the project, you tend to bring in more cross communication and the bigger the system, the more cross communication, the slower the iterations because a higher percentage of your time is done computing. It turns out it's also because the teams have different interests and different priorities. So I worked somewhere and they came in and they reorged and we had no coordination at all. And the argument was good people will make it happen. Well, good people, and teams work together until they don't because they got some other set of priorities and then the software or the process you're doing will fracture along organizational lines. So looking a little bigger here, right? Software systems will align on the communication boundary. So we went from one VP to two here. Um, and so what happens is executives and people higher up, they're actually highly incented to make their group succeed, right? Matter of fact, if they help everybody else succeed and their group fails, they'll be fired. But if their group succeeds and the other parts fail, then they'll still be fine. Right. As a matter of fact, they'll be have a competitive advantage. Uh, that only sounded mildly jaded because I'm only mildly jaded. So software systems will align on the communication boundaries. If one of these ABPs can get everything done in their space, they're probably better off. Right. And so how do you know you've got problems? So what's the warning sign? So here I created four, v four AVPs and two SVPs and an EVP, right? The number of layers that have to be crossed to force decisions to be made. You don't need to be able to read the boxes. But basically, if I've got two people in the same org, two teams in the same org trying to get something done, they only have to, they can cooperate, first of all, because they only got, they're only like one apart. And they've only got one boss to go through. So if it turns out they can't get along at all, they can just go one up. But if this little red box here needs to work with this orange box over here to get something delivered, they can try the cooperation thing. And that works a lot of times. But if priorities become jammed up or compensation or rewards or infighting takes place, then suddenly, and I've seen this, I see this all the time, we actually have to go through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Like we can try and shortcut it and have a couple AVPs talk to each other. But but in the end, 
right? You gotta go up like two layers here and then hope these two can work it out or think it's important enough to even bother with. So if this one team stalls this one over here because they've got higher priorities, like how is that gonna happen? Maybe the senior directors here, the second level can make it work because they'll have some working group, but if they can't, this is where you can totally break down. So smart people will work it out. They will actually make this work. It's amazing a lot of times until they're behind schedule or something else is at risk. So what is the reality? Cross-team dependency is our hardest to manage. And the farther apart the teams are, the farther, the harder those dependencies are to manage because the leverage becomes less, right? So one of the ways we've tried to do some of this is not have a whole bunch of point to point. And so people will do shared resource teams, right? So you'll have like in the software world, you'll have a database team, or you'll have an infrastructure team, or you'll have a testing group that tests for the whole company, right? So the problem with these shared groups is they have many bosses. Like I, we had a team person who was supposed to give us 50% of their time. Well, which 50% was it? The 50% when we needed it or the 50% when their other part wasn't being done, right? It was didn't work out very well, although they were great. But like from an org point of view, it didn't work well. So shared, so the shared team, this orange team here, they have like three different VPs that are pretending to be their bosses, right? And then accountability is hard. Like they have to pick who, what the priorities are for each of those. These teams are not gonna feel like they're getting service. And the reality is the team being held accountable for delivery here, unless they're gonna do blame pointing, is gonna be the teams out here that need the help, right? Or this team's gonna be blamed for everything, which is just as bad. So what do you see? Pendulum reorgs. We, we see this all the time in the dev, use the database space. DBAs have a database group, a center of, or the center of excellence, right? It's where you pull everybody from, architecture does the same thing, where you pull everybody from a group of teams, you create a center of excellence. After a while, that team does not seem to be as responsive as you expected them to be, right? Or Actually, people are blaming it for their failures. So then you reorg. And then five years later, you realize the distributed didn't work because you lost all your synergy and you lost your standards and everything else, and you got to bring it back. You see this all the time in DBA, DevOps, op well, not DevOps, operations, testing. One of the reasons DevOps happened, right? It's another attempt to push it out closer to the team so you don't have this cross uh, VP, cross senior director kind of responsibility thing. So authority just isn't obvious. Wait. Oh, that's the same thing, right? So authority isn't obvious and the accountability is hard. If a team fails, are they gonna be able to blame the team they're depending on? Or are they gonna to have to blame themselves? The team that other people are depending on, they're gonna blame the poor fuse short cycles that the teams gave them their requirements. So they actually couldn't get stuff done on time, but they're gonna blame them anyway for their own failures, right? So you'll see that the farther across the org it is, unless they're a superior organization, this causes problems. So what are the options for this? Uh, one of them is org changes. Align the org. If you know your product or your system, and this is why they did Department of Homeland Security, right? They thought all these teams weren't talking to each other, so if they made them all report to the same boss, it would work. Of course, it's like a million people. So that, you know, like, does that really work? Because that's a lot of infighting still. So you can align the org. What happens here? You end up with a reorg every time you realize that you have a communication problem. Oh, we want to do big data a little differently. We're going to have to reorg. We're going to do... Uh, liability uh, differently, that's a reorg. We're gonna treat something cars. We decided um, uh, e-cars are important. Like if we don't reorg around that, we're gonna build a car that looks just like ours but has a battery pack instead of an engine, right? So minor directional changes will continually drive org changes. I worked a place where we got like 1.6 reorgs a year, like 1.7. It was crazy. And that what that meant was we had to reform the teams all time, all the time, right? So forming, norming, storming, and performing. You spend a lot of time in the forming and norming phase. Uh, another way to do it is just, you know what? That's the way it works. We're just going to build power-oriented software. We're going to have a tower-oriented system. That's kind of what we looked at on the uh, police departments, right? Everybody wanted to have their own. So it was a trust no one architecture. I'm assuming that anybody outside my tower is not going to make help me make my day. So that's the other option. Uh, the third thing is you can kind of do this where you know that these pieces are apart and you end up with project management offices and oversight, inspector generals, all that kind of stuff. You give them a bunch of power and they work from outside the organization to try and make the organization to work together. Uh, those people tend to get killed off on a regular basis in a lot of orgs through that reorg pendulum thing.
There's probably other ways to do this. I don't know what it is. If you have ideas, leave me feedback after this video. So you can leverage it or you can fight it, but you ain't gonna be able to ignore it.